are this. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, Virtual Munch and Learn. My name is Margarita Sandino. I'm the Director of Education at the Dixon. I have been the Director of Education at the Dixon for 13 plus years. So you may remember if you used to come to Munch and Learn back in the day, I used to uh, introduce Munch and Learns a long time ago. And um, this week, I'm also uh, replacing Lindley Schmidt, who you may be familiar with. She's not feeling well this week still. So we're going to send her some really good healing energy. Uh, hopefully, we'll see her again soon. Um, a couple of things before we get started. Please take some time to mute yourself. Um, and also, remember that we're recording these uh, sessions. The idea is that you eventually will be able to Rewatch these sessions, uh, these presentations on our YouTube page uh, that you can find at uh, Dixon.org. It it'll take you to the link. Um, a couple of things that I'm going to ask you during the, the talk, if you want to, if you have questions uh, below, on if you go down, you'll see um, a little bubble, chat bubble that says chat. Uh, if you click on that, if you have a question, please type it in there, and then we'll go through a couple of questions at the end of the chat. Something uh, also for this for today's Munch and Learn, keep in mind that we're going to be listening to many different things, and you may have to adjust your volume as we go through them. Some might sound a little lower than others, so um, it is. They're all different, and that's that's the beauty of it. So just make sure you you adjust as needed, please. Um, today we have a very very special Munch and Learn. Um, I'm very excited. The title of it is Music of North and South America Over the Past Century. That's really a lot of stuff to cover in one hour. So <laughs> it's just cool. Um, our guest speaker today is the maestro, Robert Moody. He is the music director of Memphis Symphony Orchestra. We are very lucky that he's here to give us this talk. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Robert. Um, this is a fraction of his very, very long bio, okay? But it will give you a really good sense. He shared this with me. So 2021 marks Maestro Robert Moody's fourth season as music director of the Memphis Symphony Orchestra and his 16th season as music director of the Arizona Music Fest, the top winter classical music festival in America. Prior to Memphis, he was music director for both the Portland Symphony Maine and the Winston-Salem Symphony in North Carolina. And before that, he held conducting positions with the Phoenix Symphony, Evansville Philharmonic, Santa Fe Opera, Brevard Music Center, and the New York Youth City Youth Orchestra. He has conducted several major orchestras of the world, including Chicago, Los Angeles, Toronto, Dallas, Cape Town, Bogota in Colombia, and Vienna, Austria. Next season, he makes his debut with the Aachen, hope I pronounced that right, Symphony Orchestra in Germany and returns for a month of concerts with three major orchestra of South Africa. Other debuts will include the Sacramento Philharmonic and performances of the Modern Oratorio, considering Matthew Shepard at the National Cathedral in Washington, DC. Well, a South Carolina native, Moody holds degrees from Furman University for voice and cello and the Eastman School of Music, where he earned his conducting degree with Donald Newman. He is a Rotarian and serves and has served, serves and has served on the boards of AIDS Care Services, Winston-Salem WMCA, WDAV Classical Radio, and the Charlotte Master Chorale. Maestro Moody is an avid runner, swimmer, and snow skier. So everybody join me in welcoming Robert. So our little silent hands. Welcome, Robert. Thank, thanks, Margarita. And, and thank you guys for, for being here. I, I, I wish we were together at the Dixon Gallery. I've done some of these talks there before, but uh, we are getting close. I think we are coming out of the woods of the COVID pandemic, and we will hopefully have those kind of experiences again. Roger already mentioned it was a lot to get into to talk about North and South American music over the past century. And the honest truth is I'm gonna start by backing up 500 years. Uh, I, I tried to pull the appropriate nuggets of information for you for this talk 
Although if we talked about how American, North and South American music came to be, this would take up an entire school year, maybe an entire lifetime. So I tried to find the really salient points to talk to you about today. The general thesis is that American music, music on these two continents happened because people came from somewhere else and they created this un imagined until the 16th century melting pot of cultures. And because of this melting pot, everyone brought with them different sounds and languages and instruments and a new thing was created. So that's the general thesis statement of what we'll talk about for the next 40 minutes or so and then see if you have questions. I'm gonna start with the poem, the, the little rhyme that probably most of us, at least in North America, learned as little kids in elementary school. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. For better or worse, that's what happened. And it's important to mention that Columbus and the earlier explorers right after him didn't come to the North or South American continent. They traveled to the Caribbean. They stepped foot on the Bahamas and Cuba and Puerto Rico and Haiti and the Virgin Islands. So the first interaction with indigenous people in the Americas was in that place. And already beginnings of new musical ideas began to come about. So as peoples from Europe, and especially in the early days, we're talking about Spain and Portugal and France to, to the next extent. As people from Europe uh, and people from Africa began to come to the Carib Caribbean and then move further into what is now North America, they brought their music with them. The landowners and the slave traders, the Hispanic and Caucasian people from Europe, they did by the 17th and 18th century, they would have brought with them music of Vivaldi and Bach and Buxtehude and Handel and Haydn. But the truth is they really brought much more of their folk music. The kind of things that happened in Europe in those centuries, traveling minstrel songs, troubadour ballads, that sort of thing. From the other continent, from Africa, came slaves and they were brought for a very different reason and they were brought in agony. As Maya Angelou says, in her poem, they were bought, sold, stolen, arriving on the nightmare, praying for a dream. The music that was in their being, that was in their heart, was in, in one way the only thing they truly owned and often the only crumb of happiness or connection to their motherland that they had. This music, this African music included singing, drumming, and a lot of playing of wooden flute type instruments, either, either held much like a, we hold a recorder or much like we hold uh, a piccolo. There was a time when African drums were banned actually because a, a idea began, a concern began that slaves were using drums to communicate and to signal to each other. Turns out there was some truth to that as well. The, the drum band did not last long, however, and this drum um, pipe music and singing really be started to become part of the culture. Singing for slaves included a lot of call and response singing. I found a great video that was shot in 1929. And this is a very large gathering in the South of um, African Americans singing a, a very famous old uh, Negro spiritual. Let me share screen and play this for you just a little bit. It's just a snippet of that video. I find that video fascinating and to realize that the people in that video in, in 1929 would have been grandchildren, children, and if you watch the entire thing, you'll see much elderly people, probably slaves themselves. A really powerful step into the past. The, the, the call and response 
was the important part I wanted to point out to you there, because that call and response becomes a big part of what ends up being known as blues, jazz, Delta blues, uh, so many gospel, so many styles of music that became created. Even in these um, slave days, interestingly, whites and blacks did come together through music. The power dichotomy was completely skewed and completely uh, out of whack. The white persons had this sense of complete superior superiority, but barriers would drop to some degree with music. Uh, black slaves knew this. They knew that as long as they provided a kind of happy music that they could probably keep the peace and frankly, they could keep uh, themselves safe. Uh, the tranquility was fake, um, but it was a way that music at least tried to bring a sort of glue that bonded people together. Uh, there was an interesting um, kind of ensemble that was developing at this time, both in the Northern colonies in North Amer in America, what would be America and in the Southern colonies, but they were used in very different ways. I I'm gonna say this word, I'm gonna say fife and drum. And when I say fife and drum, you very likely would imagine this image. When I typed in fife and drum in Google, this is the first thing I saw. Let me pull it up for you real quick. Probably recognize that, yes? Let me get it up where you can see it. There you go. Yeah, that's very likely what people would recognize. Um, turns out that a, it turns out that a fife and drum ensemble was also very prominent in the South and in the Caribbean, but in a very, uh, came about in a very different way. A century before Robert Johnson in the early 18th century, uh, there were these fife and drum blues ensembles. It's one of the first times we hear the word blues and the rhythms of the Caribbean uh, sort of married with songs of uh, early slaves and created this kind of sound. Uh, this is um, a video that's from a little bit after 1929, but it gives you a real sense of what that sort of thing was like. Hold on. I wanted to keep that moving until you saw the flute player go down to his knees, because I think you can see even without text, there's a huge emotional quality to this, a, a very sort of sense of raw emotionality that's happening in the kind of music that's developing in the Southern colonies during this time. And this really was the beginning of what all styles of music in the 20th century stuff that we call country, gospel, ragtime, blues, jazz, they all derive from that kernel of sound and rhythm. Southern Europeans had brought with them a strummed instrument. Strummed instruments have been around since biblical times, uh, but in the 12th century, certainly um, Spain perfected the idea of the guitar and they brought a different similar instrument to a guitar over and it was really uh, evolved uh, during slavery times into what we now call the banjo. And that became a very important part of this musical scene as well. And that leads me to play this next clip for you, music that I think you will readily think of as, as uniquely American. Notice a couple of things that happen. Notice that this is you know, a century later, but there's still great call and response. And there's gonna be some clapping at one point and just pay attention to that. I'll, I'll mention something about that as well. Okay.
So that's a good place to stop. But you notice they started clapping at the end and it's uh, the ultimate cliche. You know, we say people who can't, don't have rhythm can't do what that audience was just doing. Clapping on the offbeat on two and four instead of one and three and four, four time. And this very little rhythmic value also plays a mammoth role because so much of the European music we know and that we evolved from with classical music has to do with the opposite, has to do with sort of the power on the principal beats. Suddenly in the Americas, the power came on the offbeat. A one, two, three, four, a one, two. We have a very different feeling entirely. So the music we've talked about thus far has taken this route from Africa or Southern Europe, Spain primarily, uh, to the to the new continent. So much of American history during the time, Canadian history as well, comes from the British Isles. And that's that movement was much more to the northern the New England colonies uh, from Pennsylvania and north. You know, the people first came on the Mayflower, and then in the century that followed, nearly a million people crossed uh, the Atlantic. Most of the people who came to northern uh, parts of the colonies were Puritans, were seeking religious freedom. They became Quakers and Shakers and the like with a gigantic focus on piety, on wholesomeness, and their music reflected these values. So as you can imagine, very different from the excerpts we I played for you already. These values developed into the American Protestant hymn. Now countries the world around have had hymns for a very long time, but the American hymn uh, because of this Puritan influence evolved in a way unique and it's important to talk about uh, as we sort of see how this translated to the great composers of the 20th century. Um, I can't believe I get to do this but my degree from Furman University, I studied voice and cello, actually my degree is a uh, bachelor of music in church music and I never get to use this part of the degree but I took a course uh, in college called hymnology Hymnology, the study of hymns. That's 12 weeks of my life. I will never get back again. Actually, I found it pretty interesting. And there were some really, really um, fascinating things that, that you sort of see that even though you've looked at a hymnal your whole life, maybe I, you had never paid attention to. If you're here, if you're a choir director, if you are a church organist, then you might have noticed these things and worked with this part of hymnology. If not, you may have not uh, known it was there. I'm talking about hymn meter and hymn tune and how the two can interact with each other so that you can take multiple different sets of hymn text and align them with multiple different hymn tunes. It's all based on the meter of the text and how many syllables are in one line. So a lot of hymns, have an eight syllable first line, a six syllable second line, then eight, then six. There are two, and I'll, I will show this on the screen while I talk about this. Uh, let me make sure I get to the right, right place. There's that, and there's uh, uh, this one I need. One second. Uh -huh. Can you all see? Hold on, I lost my word. Let me try one more time. If it doesn't work time number two, I'm just gonna sing it for you. You'll understand what I'm doing. There we go, aha, got it. Okay, I'm gonna scroll down to right here. Can you all, can you all see these hymns? Okay. Yes. The meter of these, the meter of these, of these first two tunes, which are incredibly popular, fall into this eight-syllable, six-syllable category. There we go. And I'm going to sing the lyrics of one to the more well-known tune of the other. We sing "America the Beautiful" to a tune called "Materna," the hymn tune. Uh, we sing "Amazing Grace" to a tune called "New Britain." But you can switch them. It could go like this. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. Or you could switch it up and do um, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. You see how that works. I find this fascinating because, and church choir directors and church organists, they use this, there are, there are Google websites and there are books devoted to ideas of how you compare certain metered hymns to certain hymn tunes. This became very important in the music of the early um, northern continents, the New England continent. And in the time of the revolution, the American Revolution, uh, this is reminder decades before Francis Scott Key wrote the text to the Star Spangled Banner and a century plus before that became the official national anthem. During the time of the American Revolution, there was a, a tune that I'm going to wager you may not have heard of that was by far and wide the most popular tune of the day. The tune was called Chester. It was a complete hymn setting. It was set up as 8888. So all uh, four lines had eight syllables, and it was a story of how the great General Washington was continually confounding Cornwallis and all of the other British generals. So let's just hear the first verse of Chester. text moves on to talk in detail about the various uh, British generals and how they were all thwarted by Washington and patriots. So had we been living 200 plus years ago, we would all know that tune as well as we know the Star Spangled Banner today. And that came from hymnody. And the songs that we begin to think of as patriotic songs really came from that sense of early American hymnody. People like Aaron Copeland, Charles Ives are going to really capitalize on this idea in the 20th century. So here's the thing. All of the music that I've referenced so far has been connected to folk music or church music. You know, these were mu music that was sung for church gathering, gatherings, family gatherings uh, to help get through the drudgery of slave labor in the fields. Um, as late as the 19th century, any American composer who was working on composing quote unquote classical music didn't seem to have any connection to these fundamentals, these seeds that I've been talking about thus far at all. In fact, what they were doing is they were trying their best to sound like the people who were alive on the other side of the Atlantic with name like, names like Brahms and Schubert and Beethoven and Wagner and Tchaikovsky. And this was not working. I, I will prove it to you. you. You don't have to raise your hand, but take a, take a uh, mental, um, just decide how many of these names you know uh, on this inventory. Have you heard of the American composers, Dudley Buck, Frederick Archer, Louis Gottschalk, Oscar Hammerstein. Oh wait, I bet right now you're saying, yes, I've heard of Oscar Hammerstein. I'm not talking about his son from Broadway. I'm talking about Oscar Hammerstein Sr., who was a classical composer in the 19th century. See what I mean? These names don't trip off the tongue like Brahms and Schumann and Schubert and Wagner, in which we know the world around. Something very important happened in 1890 uh, that really changed this and finally got classical composers to pay attention to all the music that we've sort of skimmed over in this past 20 minutes or so. This is when Antonin Dvorak came to the United States, the great Czech composer Dvorak, who was very close to Brahms. Brahms was really his mentor. He was wooed by um, a group of uh, people in society in New York City to come to America in 1890 to become the first head of the first official conservatory of music in America. Now this conservatory of music, it evolved over about the next 30 years into what we now call the Juilliard School of Music. It's, it's a pretty good school. It's not as good as the Eastman School of Music, but nonetheless, it's a pretty good school. I say that as an Eastman School of Music grad. So anyway, Dvorak was the one who, who started this 
school. He was here for three years in the United States. He was either in New York or he spent the summers in Iowa in a Czech community in Spillville, Iowa. He is the one who noticed this. For him, it was so obvious uh, what was happening about American composers trying to copy Europeans. And at the end of his time, in the last several months, he gave a talk uh, on numerous occasions. And in these talks, he would say the following, you are failing to create music that will last because you are digging in the wrong soil. Stop digging in the European soil and start digging in the American soil. It's ripe and ready for the picking. And he had two very specific ideas. He talked, he was very interested in what he called the Negro spiritual, the old slave spiritual. And he was also very interested in Native American music. In fact, he tried his hand at creating works that would be sort of the way to spurn on this creative idea in American composers. He wrote a piece that he thought was going to be his most famous piece of all time called The Song of Hiawatha. Didn't really become that big of a hit, but nonetheless, he was using Native American rhythms and melodies in that piece. Now, the other one did become his biggest hit. He wrote the New World Symphony while he was here, and the New World Symphony has in the second movement, the slow movement, has a theme that people would just swear was an old slave spiritual that Dvorak took and put right into the music. It's the slow movement played beautifully by the English horn, but it does have lyrics, and the lyrics are, going home, going home. I am going home, quiet like some still day. I am going home. You probably recognize that tune. Turns out the story about it being an old spiritual is not true at all. That's actually a Czech folk song that he put into the piece, but the lore about it was so popular that really it's become part of a uh, standard tradition to think that's an old spiritual. And it is sung now as going home as a spiritual. So these young composers, they paid attention to Dvorak. They paid attention to his words. And it's a fair statement to say that had he not come to America and made that sort of impassioned plea to young composers. After that, I don't think there would have been a Scott Joplin, George Gershwin, Aaron Copeland, Leonard Bernstein, Cole Porter, Elvis, John Williams, and on and on. That instruction and that uh, really seed of inspiration was that important. So let's put a pin in music of the United States and move south. The story of how music moved to South and Central America, the Caribbean, even Mexico, is a very different story than how it ended up evolving in the United States. Here, the story is much more connected to Spanish influence African rhythms and the music of um, so many Ayure, Incan, Mayan um, cultures that brought their music as Spanish and African slaves came. There's some sobering stats that I think we forget. We tend to hear the word slave in the United States and we think that the bulk of slavery on the American continents happened in the, in the American South. Not true at all. Over, over the centuries that slaves were shipped from Africa to the New World, 12.5 million slaves were shipped to the New World. Approximately 2 million of those died en route. Of the 10.7 million who came to the New World, approximately 390,000 came to North America. The other 10 plus million went to the Caribbean and to South America and primarily to Brazil. So that influence actually became much, much greater in those countries, even than here in the United States. Um, the Native American instruments, uh, the instruments of, of the Ayure, the Inca, later on Aztec and Maya, began to play a real role and they merged with the Spanish guitar. This, the Spain absolutely really brought the guitar to the fore from as early as the 12th century. And then in the hands of South America, it became an even higher level of multifaceted art form. But folk music is part of this. I'm gonna play for you now a little bit of an, of an Andean Bolivian folk group. Um, if you've traveled to Europe in the summertime, especially during height of tourist season, you will often see mostly Bolivian, but you will see um, South American bands, very similar to this, playing in the city squares all over the place. Here's a little bit of Bolivian folk music. Notice the guitar, 
notice the the wooden flutes they use but they're different than the african ones there tend to be there's this uh, a wonderful pan flute that's almost like a a wooden harmonica and notice the percussion it's shells being shaken from their wrists I could go on for quite a while, but I'll pause it right there. And so this is a great sense of how the folk music in South America sounded and was created in a very different way than the folk music in North America. One interesting thing to mention very quickly is the rhythms that developed um, really south of the United States and throughout South America and very much in the Caribbean islands. And it's this sort of uh, a, a change back and forth quickly between a triple meter and a duple meter. Jamie Bernstein is a good friend of mine. She was here with the symphony about three years ago. And her, um, she's, she's in a unique position because she's the child of an American father, Leonard Bernstein, and a Venezuelan mother, uh, Felicia Montenegre. And um, she does young person's concerts about her father's music and she'll get the kids to say this, and you can try and say it where you are. She'll say, say, hamburger, hamburger, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog. Hamburger, hamburger, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog. Hamburger, hamburger, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog. I like to be in America. It's that interesting sense of how sort of three juxtaposes against two that South Americans played with this rhythmic structure much more aggressively than North Americans. And it gives a very unique uh, spin to so much of the sound. A favorite living composer of mine is from Mexico, so, so part of North America, but Arturo Marquez is a favorite composer of mine. And I've conducted a work of his, uh, which is called the Danson Numero Dos, Danson Number no. Two, as many times as I've probably conducted any work in the repertory. Um, it, I'm gonna play a little bit of a video for you with Gustavo Dudamel conducting the um, Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra in Venezuela. And you hear the word youth orchestra. I will tell you that under Dudamel especially, the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra was not, not the best youth orchestra in the world. They were one of the best orchestras in the world. It, it's the, 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 the playing is at a jaw dropping level. Here they are playing some of the danson and the danson is a Cuban dance form and he's, he's mimicking in the beginning what it might be like to be in a sultry cafe in Havana where there is a clarinet player and maybe a violin player and a percussionist and a bass player and a piano a little combo as you're sort of enjoying a you know nice night in Havana so here's here are a couple of snippets of Marquez Danson numero dos To jump forward a little bit, but notice the percussion that was used, a nice wood block. So if you watch in this next uh, part of the finale of this piece, you will see a great instrument called the guiro. It's a gourd with ridges carved onto one side and a wood wooden stick scrapes across it. Gives a very, very much uh, wonderful Latin sound to it. And uh, you can also hear the three against two quite a lot in the end. 
This is one of the best endings of a piece of music that I know. <laughs> Isn't that great? Tremendous piece. We've, we've done it here at the Memphis Symphony before, and I'm sure I'll program it again. It's one of those fun ways to come out of the pandemic, I think, is to hear that music. Um, there are a lot of uh, composers. I, I will tell you that once this um, talk is over, I'm going to put on the Memphis Symphony Facebook page a list of composers of the 20th century, both in North and South America, um, and then also specifically a list of living composers that I would really encourage you to, to learn more about if you don't know their names and do some YouTube searching and listen to their music because there's so many uh, great composers that we could highlight. Uh, there are fantastic living composers uh, in both North and South America. Uh, one of those living composers is, has, is a young man who's already starting a really fantastic early career with performances with uh, large orchestras in South America and a premiere coming up at the Memphis Symphony at the end of May. Uh, his name is Juan Sebastian Cardona Ospina, and he um, is a doctoral student at the moment at the University of Memphis. He had a piece premiered uh, with the Orchestra, Orchestra Philharmonica de Bogota, the Bogota Philharmonic, um, a couple of years ago. And I want to play for you just a little bit of this piece, and uh, I'll share the screen and listen, and then we'll talk about it after that. Okay. Excellent piece. And this is fun for me because Juan Sebastian is on with us. If you're on, there are three pages of Zooms. So if you would need to scroll to find him, but Juan, I asked him if he would join us for this Zoom and he's here. And uh, how many times do you get to talk to a living composer? Uh, this is great. So Juan, welcome. You can unmute if you haven't. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for being here. So um, it's an honor to me being here and be able to speak to all of you. So t tell, tell us uh, where you're from, where were you born and raised, and uh, how did you get into music? What were your first uh, instruments that you played? Well, I am, like you say, from Colombia, but the coffee area, like a different area from Margarita. She's from the capital. 
I am, I would say, a countryside guy. I was born in a re really a small town uh, in the mountains. Um, and I started there in, the, in my town with the band of the, uh, of the, that is called House of Culture. That is the place where uh, every, every kid after school go to play music, to, to read, to play chess, to, to spend the afternoon there. So I used to do that there in my town. I used to play trumpet there in the band. And when I finished uh, high school, I decided to continue studying music. So I went to a, a close city to my town that is called Manizales, a really small city if you compare it with other ones. And um, I was continuing playing trumpet there. But at the end of my career, I had the chance to make an interchange in a university in Argentina. And there in Argentina, uh, uh, I took uh, composition classes and I decided to become a composer there. I, that was the moment that I decided to become that. And after that, then I studied my master there and moved here to study my doctorate. Uh, you've written, I've, I've, I've known your music for a few years now and we finally get a chance to premiere one of your pieces. We commissioned Juan to write a work uh, which is called uh, Las Venas del Oceano and um, that means the veins of the ocean and it's going to premiere on our Canon uh, concert in May of this year and um, I will tell you we have a concert this Saturday night um, all, mostly Beethoven and one amazing work by Florence Price and the piano soloist is another Colombian, David Cordoba Hernandez, and he's playing the Beethoven second piano concerto just phenomenally well, incredible. And we're playing the eighth symphony. We could only have 300 people in the Cannon Center this week because of COVID, it's uh, sold out. We think that in April and May, because the news is finally so good, we think we'll be able to sell not 2000 seats, but probably up to 50% capacity. So if you're interested, uh, make sure you check that out and you can hear this work. Um, what would you, in a, you know, one minute or less, what would you tell people that they should know about this piece, Las Venas del Oceano? Well, I would like to highlight something that you said at the beginning, and it, it was that the music that we have in North and South America always came from other places. And the title in a way wants to reflect that, that a lot of the music that we have came from the sea and through the rivers, and we started from there. In the same, in the same way that Mississippi is important for uh, North America or for the United States, there is a river in Colombia that is important to us that is called the Magdalena. And I think that those rivers are the veins of the ocean. Those rivers, we connect all of us, uh, North and South America. And I try to reflect that, uh, the kind of conflict or, or or harmony that could exist between both. At the same time, uh, I use kind of the things that Maestro Moody uh, named here before. And it was that, that rhythmic, uh, that polyrhythmic thing, three against two, that is very, that is present there in the score. And um, at the same time, when you pay a lot of attention from the beginning to the end, it started in a G, that is the first speech, the first note of the, of the piece, and ends on G2. So I want to reflect how all of those things start in one point and end in the same point after a lot of conflict and development there. <laughs> this, is, this is the cover of my score and I don't know how well you can see, but here's some of the inside. It's a very intricate piece and it, it won't be premiered until May, but in the world where you can um, enjoy music, uh, create a, a product on a computer. He has a, what we call a mock-up on an MP3. So this is a computer generated mock-up. The orchestra live will be different, but here's a little snippet of what this sounds like. And I'm just gonna play you just about uh, 30 seconds of it. So you have a sense of just how cool this premiere is going to be. Here you go, give it a listen.
It's so cool. And that's just a computer mock-up. It's gonna be amazing to see this uh, really come together. Juan, I'm so glad you wrote this piece and I can't wait for the premiere of it. Uh, and that's coming up at the end of May. Um, I, we have just a short amount of time left and I have one more uh, snippet to play for you and then I'll see what questions you have. Um, we have to include also the American West when we talk about the American sound. Uh, we can't do this talk without, you know, getting into the idea of go west young man a little bit because that really the after the civil war uh the really the just the pushing out into the frontier um cowboys that really added yet another dimension and the open space added a sense of american music where we tend to um, play music with much greater intervals in our melodies than the one or two step intervals that are very prominent in the melodies of say the european composers uh, the, the person who did, I think, the greatest job of embodying how orchestral music, classical music, uh, married with the music of the Old West was Aaron Copeland. And I, there's a great video of him conducting himself, a uh, piece that I will say needs no introduction. But I'm going to also point out that notice how he mentions the title. We all tend to, I think, in some sort of highfalutin way, think that this ballet is called Rodeo. It is not. Martha Graham and Aaron Copeland always called it rodeo. Here's the video. The idea of using a rodeo as a setting for a ballet was born in the mind of my friend, the American choreographer, Agnes DeMille. It was at her invitation that I composed the score and the whole down is the final dance in that ballet. musicians has always been that Copeland was one of the greatest composers of all time and not a terribly great conductor, but I digress for just a moment. Uh, there is one more piece, one more composer I'm going to introduce you to as the sort of finale as, as we close this. Uh, I'm going to see if you have any questions and if you've been thinking of any and you want to type them in the chat now, um, you can do that. And as you're putting that together, let me just bring to you a couple of quick uh, ideas to sort of wrap this concept up. First of all, music is made of three basic building blocks. Uh, I think we know this, melody, harmony, rhythm. And here are just from 50,000 feet, the way that melody, harmony, and rhythm will have, have affected American music. Melody, um, the, the folk songs which came from Europe, the British Isles, Africa, um, African melodies had more in, in, intricate rhythm. Melody played on simple wooden flutes, simple Irish fiddles, rhythm, uh, African drums, offbeat clapping, uh, South and Native American percussion, shakers, rattles, the banjo added to make strings percussion, the chant and dance rhythm of Native American peoples, and then harmony and, and the intervals in melody also become very important. Uh, I'll give you a, a sense. Here's a very famous European melody it's from the opera E. Pagliacci. The, when the tenor sings very famously, Prendi Pagliaccio, su tu amore in franco. Do you notice he's only moving between three notes? Very close together. Pair that with one of the most famous American tunes, The Fanfare for the Common Man by Aaron Copeland. This just sounds American. Do you see what I mean? 
Also the Irish fiddling, which became Appalachian fiddling, which became a real sound uh, at the end of the 19th century, became very important. This was actually written, this tune, for the Ken Burns documentary, The Civil War, but um, we think of it as an old tune. It's called The Ashokan Farewell, and this is where grace notes that someone mentioned earlier and sliding between pitches is a much more pronounced American um, sort of take on music than its European cousins. Here's the Ashkin fa Farewell. You've probably heard that before. So this is just a quick roundup of melody, harmony, rhythm that come together. Uh, one last piece of music that I think you'll enjoy, but before that, are there any questions, Margarita, that I can take on? Yes, there's a few. Okay, so uh, I think this one is from Paul. I think it was just Paul. He said, thank you, what an interesting talk. Uh, we have another question. Maestro Robert, will you have tickets to the concert on Saturday on Zoom as well? Is this a virtual thing that people could attend? I'm so glad you asked. So check again, check out our Facebook mm -hmm. page. It's the best way to do this. Uh, just type in Memphis Symphony. You'll get to our Facebook. If you want to go straight to the website, it's memphissymphony.org. All one word, Memphis Symphony. And WKNO is live streaming the concerts. So you can listen to, we haven't done this before and we're very excited about it. We are live streaming through in a partnership with WKNO. So okay. if you don't have tickets or, yet, and this one is sold out, um, and certainly that's a much safer way to enjoy the concert, uh, please look to our website, look to our Facebook and we'll have that information. Um, I, I, right. I will say I believe it's going to stream video as well, but I'm not 100% sure they've worked out all the operational aspects okay. of that. Okay, we'll be on the lookout. Yes. Uh, another question, when did the symphony orchestra start? The symphony in general, yeah, the or orchestra, so the, the, the idea of an ensemble gathering together in what we now think of as a symphony or a symphony orchestra happened, give or take, in the early part, l very late part of the 17th, but certainly mm -hmm. the early part of the 18th century. And it, or composers began writing something. It came out of the sonata. The sonata was a solo vehicle that would have a certain organization of movements, a fast movement, a slow movement, a fast movement. Then they would break into more of a four movement sonata and then ensembles would play these. And the first people uh, to call them symphonies were composers in Germany with names like Stamitz and then a more famous name, Haydn. And they began to call these works symphonies and as they um, became popular the ensembles that played them became known as symphony orchestras and by the way if you're wondering where philharmonics came from it, it's just the it really depends on who founded the organization if the musicians themselves or the court put together a group to play symphonies they would be called symphony orchestras if friends of music if philanthropists gathered together they would be called philharmonics because that takes us back to the Greek root of friends of music. So a philharmonic and a symphony are really the same bodies. It's just the history of that city and that place, how they got their name. Thank Any you. others? You have some comments. Uh, uh, Judy Stevenson seeing, uh, totally enjoyed this hour. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, William McManus, excellent and informative talk. Julie Parati. Uh, who is our curator here at the Dixon says, this was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this and for bringing Juan into the conversation. Very interesting. Uh, Pat says, as always, Mr. Moody is wonderful. Love that. Haley says, thank you. I had fun. I hope someday to be in the symphony. I have to go practice now. So how long should I practice? My mom makes me do it 30 minutes. Yeah, so I'm um, keep practicing and easily 30 minutes a day. And I will I will tell you the okay. good or bad news that a lot of people by the time they're in college and really focused on becoming a full professional, they will believe it or not practice four, five, six hours a day on their instrument. 
Um, so it's, this is not for the weak of heart. Those people sitting in the symphony, you realize they've gone through just mm -hmm. a, almost athletic training to become a players at the level at, at which they are. Yeah. So uh, I'm well, going to finish. Uh, go ahead. This Mark. is a good start for Haley. I think one day, hopefully, she'll give a talk for us when she is conducting her own symphony or in her, you know, doing her own thing. Right, Haley? We'll, we hope to hear from you. Um, so back yeah, to so, Robert. Yeah, thanks. So just to, just to finish, um, and I will actually start playing this music and I will probably not talk anymore. So as you enjoy it, you can, um, un unless uh, the Dixon folks tell me differently, I'd say let this be the ending. I won't say anything after. Um, I'm going to play a piece for you, two segments. And uh, Margarita mentioned in the beginning that I'm actually the music director of two organizations. Uh, the other is the Arizona Music Fest. It's, it's, it's not hyperbole. It's the best uh, classical music festival in the wintertime really anywhere in North America. And we put an orchestra together that has members of New York Philharmonic, Chicago Symphony, Cleveland Orchestra, San Francisco Symphony, Dallas Symphony, and on and on. It, it, it's like an all-star uh, event. And we commissioned my close friend, composer Mason, Mason Bates, to write a work for the festival about 10 years ago. And Mason and I were actually given a helicopter tour over the entire state to help Mason get inspired to write something connected to Arizona. So we lifted off in a helicopter in Scottsdale. We flew up um, north towards Sedona, Arizona, up to Flagstaff. We, we got just to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. We came back uh, a little more easternly over something called Montezuma's Castle, some very famous Native American ruins. We ended up hovering by another ruin called the Tonto National Monument. It's cliff dwellings. And as only a helicopter can, we just sat in the air and stared at this place. And then we came back uh, down into Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, Mason got permission from one of the tribes of Arizona, the Salt River Pima Indian community, to use one of their chants as the basis for the piece. So I'm going to play you the beginning where you can hear, he writes it into the music, the helicopter taking off. It's quite obvious. And then once we get the helicopter aloft, I'm going to skip forward to where the recording of the Native American chant and the, the chant is called from the mountains to the sea. If you're wondering what they're what they're singing about and you'll see how they chant. And then he has the violins pick up the melody and then you can hear the helicopter uh, wings, helicopter blades beginning to invade on uh, that moment and bring us back to Earth. So. Uh, I'm going to start playing this and I'm going to say thank you all so much for uh, being here. Certainly, we hope to see you at many of our concerts and we hope and pray that we are all fully vaccinated and safe and gathering together in large crowds with large orchestras again very soon. Here is a little bit of Mason Bates Desert Transport. <laughs> Helicopter. is up in the sky and I have a few photos I can show you as we play the rest of this so I'll get this set for the ending I'm getting near to the Native American chant and listen at your leisure uh, from here to the end
if you're still on, I will tell you that that piece has been played by orchestras around the world now, and that recording was the Memphis Symphony Orchestra a couple of years ago. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you all for you. being part of this. I hope it was interesting for you, and I hope to see you at the Dixon or at our concerts. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Robert. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next week. Uh, Robert, seriously, thank you so, so much. This was awesome. Thank you. We'll see everybody next week. Bye. Excellent.